So thank you to Shay, to Saba, and to everyone who has put this um, conference together. Thank you especially for um, thinking of and including uh, us as AMI's graduate students. It really means a lot to be able to um, think about and talk about uh, her work and its influence on my own thinking with everyone here today. Um, much like Ami followed Arendt uh, in her thinking and her scholarship um, for so many years, um, I'm really going to spend the rest of my time uh, as an academic and, and really in my life also following Ami um, and, and really working with and working through and thinking with um, her projects. Uh, saying that, uh, I'm a bit in the reeds um, and I've been uh, spending a lot of time with teaching about genocide. Um, so this is a piece uh, that really resonates with my dissertation work um, and I'm finding lots of overlaps, um, I'll call them in this talk, I'll, uh, echoes, with the projects that I take, up, take on in my dissertation. Um, so my work today, my hope today, um, is to give an account of Ami's defensive inattention. This is um, a term that she uses to uh, reflect on her pedagogical analysis of an undergraduate class that she teaches on genocide. Um, I then want to think about some of the echoes of this defensive inattention that I see in Susan Bryson's aftermath um, and that I see in Jonathan Shea's Achilles in Vietnam. Um, and it's my hope that by putting these three pieces, these three sets of ideas and conversation with each other, um, that we'll be able to sort of sharpen all of them simultaneously, um, that we can uh, kind of think about what this sort of defensive inattention really is, what it looks like and how it works. Um, as a content note, um, because of the nature of Ami's teaching about genocide, uh, as well as because of where my own work enters this piece, um, there'll be discussions of genocide, sexual violence, and combat trauma in uh, my talk today. Okay. So I want to start by looking at Ami's teaching about genocide. In the article, she offers a pedagogical exploration of what she terms defensive inattention. While the piece initially reads like a pedagogical exercise, I think Ame points to and develops a response that is repeated throughout the modern Western liberal ethico political structure, her term, uh, that she wants her students to challenge. And so I start here by sketching out her concept of defensive inattention. I then apply it to the cases of sexual violence and combat trauma, um, and I modify it to better accommodate this broader range of cases. Part of why I find Ame's account. Um, of defensive inattention so interesting is because of those echoes that I mentioned that reverberate through my own dissertation. I see this um, turn that she talks about in Susan Bryson's aftermath, in Jonathan, Jonathan Shea's Achilles in Vietnam, and even in Eva Cate's Love, Love's Labor, um, among many other places. So ultimately, I argue that Ami's articulation of defensive inattention identifies and problematizes a habituated mode of thinking that permeates our discussions of trauma. By considering cases of genocide, sexual violence, and combat trauma, we can further develop the concept of defensive inattention to challenge our habituated thought patterns and to better understand each of these cases. So a bit of quick background, what exactly is going on in Ami's teaching about genocide? What is it, how is it that she develops this concept of a defensive inattention? Um, her piece starts again as a pedagogical exploration. She's reviewing a recent genocide course that she's taught with undergraduates. I say recent simply because I've been, as I said, stuck in the reads reading. She's actually uh, published this, I think in 2002. And so we're talking almost 20 years ago, um, but I'm finding in classes that I took with her maybe five or so years ago in Binghamton. Um, and even in my readings now, again, this theme reverberates. Um, so as she thinks about how the course went, uh, she explains that she sought what she calls deep engagement with serious, complex, and limit or extreme cases to challenge, though not necessarily endorse or replace, the students' habituated modes and patterns of thinking. It's this deep engagement that she takes to be um, an essential part of her pedagogical practice. She pulls, of course, um, from an oppositional critical pedagogy. Uh, she sees um, this pedagogy as 
being useful for developing a certain set of skills and those skills being useful for critiquing or challenging various ideologies. Um, so she sees uh, sort of a historical trajectory of feminism, uh, Marxism, anti-racist and post-colonial thought, uh, critiquing ideology using this type of deep engagement where we look at these um, extreme cases where we really challenge habituated modes and patterns of thinking. Um, she says that the Marxist, uh, Marxist thinkers have um, sort of pointed out some of the contradictions in this ideology. Feminists have labeled the ideology as male, and anti-racist and post-colonial theorists have identified this ideology as being um, European white. So she's taking on her work um, of teaching this genocide course to undergraduate students, uh, wanting them to develop analytic and terror interrogative skills and competencies and to form creative new syntheses so that they can be used for ideology critique and specifically because of the own her own trajectory of questions um, she really wants uh, the students to be thinking about and challenging um, though not necessarily giving up on um, or replacing uh, modern western liberal ethical politics Doing this, she recognizes that while she's given students um, this substantive material, these extreme or limit cases of violence, of genocide, uh, that they aren't taking up the work in the ways that she thought that they would, um, in the ways that she hoped that they would, rather than uh, sort of challenging the um, modern Western liberal ethical politics, they actually sort of double down on or embrace it. Um, what she feels to be rather uncritically. Um, and so she uh, identifies a defensive inattention that they partake in is a way to flee the difficulty and the complexity of the material that she's presented them. Um, so I'm quoting her here. She, in talking about defensive inattention, says, I therefore suspect that to the extent that the students presented themselves as bored because they already knew what they were supposed to learn, they enabled themselves to simulate an absence from the course, to excuse this simulated absence and also hide it. At face value, the question of prevention may look like the most urgent question one could ask with regard to genocide, but what the question accomplishes is the redirection of attention away from genocide into an imaginary genocide-free possible world. In this case, because the simulated absence is achieved through attention to an important related and relevant question, it is simultaneously excused and covered up. So she recognizes that students uh, sort of have a um, two-part response to the difficult material she's asked them to grapple with. First, they uh, feign a sort of boredom, a familiarity with the um, genocide uh, materials that she's asked them to address. Uh, they then very, very quickly pivot um, to talking about and thinking about the question of pre prevention, uh, to thinking about how it is that we stop um, future genocide, that we prevent these future atrocities. Um, for her, she sees this defensive inattention as a form of resistance. Um, she sees it as an absence of sort of being with the material and thinking through the material, as we all remember she was so adamant about do doing. Um, and she sees it as an attempt to flee. Um, a typical account of defensive inattention would probably stop there, right? She's recognized um, a pattern in students' thinking and in their behavior, uh, and she gives what she finds to be an intuitive, plausible explanation of what they're doing. Uh, they're really, you know, separating themselves from this difficulty. Um, but in sort of typical Ami fashion, um, she continues to explore the implications of this account, right? If her students are in fact um, sort of engaging in this defensive inattention, then what they're really doing is they're separating themselves from the material. Um, but it's possible, she thinks, um, and the way the article reads, it seems almost probable that some of them are being traumatized by the substantive material she's offering them. Um, she doesn't just sort of settle with the defensive inattention uh, or 
yeah, the defense of inattention, um, she moves on to thinking about narrative fetishism, and she concludes that it is this substantive material of her courses that may be traumatizing her students, um, where boredom and prevention are mechanisms for connection and intelligibility, allowing for the students an avenue for intelligible speech. So because they're traumatized so much of um, traumatic experience, she uses the work of uh, Judith Harmon, Herman and uh, Carruth, um, because so much of that traumatic experience, even uh, what we might think of as a secondary trauma that the students experience by witnessing or listening or thinking through this um, very in-depth uh, sort of sense of, of horror um, and, and intelligibility in some ways. Um, it separates them from intelligibility. It separates them from intelligible speech. And so, of course, she turns to Arendt uh, in order to address this problem of being stuck with the possibility of being unable to escape narrative fetishism. Narrative fetishism, um, for Ame in this case, is um, undesirable. It is going to uh, postpone and indefinitely prolong the reconstitution of the self um, in a way that would allow us to mourn, it would allow us to sort of continue, move forward and think about these, um, in her case, atrocities that she's looking at um, in this, this sense of horror. Um, so she turns to a rent to sort of address uh, this issue of narrative fetishism and she thinks that she has um, sort of found a way not to circumvent, um, but to embrace, to um, accept kind of the complexity of the situation that she's faced with uh, via her students and really via her own grappling with uh, the topic of genocide. So this is the background that I kind of need in order to move into what I find interesting about um, Ami's account of defensive inattention. What I want to stick with and what I want to think about is the question of intelligible speech. So in order to sort of talk about those echoes um, that I see in uh, the work that I'm doing for my dissertation, primarily through Jonathan Shea and through Susan Bryson, but also maybe if I have time through Eva Kate's work, um, the idea of intelligibility, the idea of being able to re-enter the conversation through intelligible speech that isn't uh, sort of a, a cheapening, a narrative fetishism, a way of resorting to old modes of thinking and analysis. Um, the way to do this then uh, is for Ami again through a rent. Um, but I think for me, thinking about this topic, um, what is striking is what I see is a disconnect between Ami's approach to intelligibility, Jonathan Shea's approach, and Susan Bryson's approach. So that's where I want to uh, sort of sit in and think for a moment. Um, in Jonathan Shea's work, Jonathan Shea works with um, Vietnam veterans uh, who have uh, extreme cases of post-traumatic stress disorder due to their uh, combat. Um, and he gives an example um, in talking about intelligibility and talking about um, sort of speaking about trauma. Uh, he gives an example of one of the men that he works with. Um, and I'd like to read it and put it in conversation with, um, with Ami's own a uh, way of thinking about the intelligibility or the speakability of trauma. So, sorry, there's not actually enough light for me to read it. Um, so the veteran's account says, I had just come back from Vietnam and my first wife's parents gave a dinner for me and my parents and her brothers and their wives. And after dinner, we were all sitting in the living room and her father said, so tell us what it was like. And I started to tell them and I told them, and do you know within five minutes, the room was empty? They was all gone except my wife. After that, I didn't tell anybody I had been in Vietnam. I want to contrast this with a quote that um, Shea pulls from Paul Fussell. He's written about 
the First World War, um, and he's thinking again about this concept of intelligibility of speech. Uh, and he says that one of the cruxes of war is the collision between events and the language available or thought appropriate to describe them. Logically, there is no reason why the English language could not perfectly well render the actuality of warfare. It is rich in terms like blood, terror, agony, madness, shit, cruelty, murder, sellout, and hoax, as well as phrases like legs blown off, intestines gushing out over his hands, screaming all night, bleeding to death from the rectum, and the like. The problem was less one of language than of gentility and optimism. The real reason that soldiers fall silent is that soldiers have discovered that no one is very interested in the bad news that they have to report. What listener wants to be torn and shaken when he doesn't have to be? We have made unspeakable mean indescribable. It really means nasty. And so these two quotes, I'll pull in a quote from Ami in just a moment. Um, but these two quotes give us a lot to think about if we're going to follow Ami's account of defensive inattention, right? If she is worried about narrative fetishism, which she is, if she is concerned about the potential trauma that her students are experiencing um, due to the substantive material that she's offered them, then we really want to ask the question about intelligibility. How do we allow the students in this case to re-enter the conversation? She says that they seem to have found their own way. Um, they seem to use boredom as a way to uh, sort of announce their understanding of the material, and they use the prevention question is a way to speak philosophically, to be understood intelligibly um, on very philosophical standings or ground um, in a way that allows them to make sense or to incorporate uh, the horrors of the material that they're looking at. So she says that this is one way that we can think about um, speech and intelligibility. What I find in Jonathan Shea's material is a contradiction, um, a challenge almost, to the claims that come up in not only Ami's account of defensive inattention and her students' use of speech as a way to become, render themselves again, once more intelligible, um, but it's also a challenge to the narratives on trauma that she consults, that of Herman and of Caruth. So much of the narrative about trauma Thanks, Shay. Give me maybe two more minutes. Um, so much of the narrative on trauma um, is going to say that we can't fully explain, we can't uh, bring to light, we can't um, articulate the traumatic experiences that have happened, uh, the traumatic experiences that we're trying to account for. Um, but I think that if we think seriously with Jonathan Shea, maybe what is going on is not actually that we don't have the ability to articulate or to think about trauma as it's happening. Um, instead, what we're looking at is maybe a very narrative of the um, modern Western liberal ethical politics that Ami is asking her students to challenge. I think what we see is that the narrative of that Western ethical politics is asking us to silence, to cover up, to quiet questions, situations of trauma, to quiet these situations of horror. So when Ami says, and I'm pulling, this is actually something that was quoted in one of the earlier talks, um, when Ami says that when, quote, I describe my own encounters with violence or other violent events in what seems to me as all the small and shrinking details that I can pull together, I nonetheless feel that there is a residue that exceeds the words that I use and therefore is unnamed and though perhaps expressible in other ways, like painting or sculpting, in some considerable manner conceptually unknown. I want to challenge this idea of some element of trauma being sort of stuck in the conceptual unknown. It's this, I think, that I pull from the defensive and attention piece. It's this uh, echo that I see in Susan Bryson's work when um, people respond to Susan Bryson's own traumatic uh, experience of sexual violence. Um, you know, they say, they ask questions about what she could have possibly done to instigate such an experience. And this happens at the level of family, friends, and really people who don't know her. It's this um, 
lack of conceptual intelligibility that comes with trauma that I want to challenge by thinking that we do in fact have the language, a la Jonathan Shea and, and Fussell, we do in fact have the language to discuss these things, but rather we're situated in a Western ethical political uh, circumstance that wants to minimize these accounts of trauma. It wants to quiet um, these narratives so that they are not intelligible in large part because they are contradictory to that Western liberal ethical political project. So if we think of, again, what we learn from the Marxist, the feminist and uh, anti-racist and post-colonial theorist, the rendering of trauma narratives as intelligible as speech um, really runs counter to seeing the Western ethical political project, at least one version of it, um, the Kate version, that says that we're independent individuals, that we're capable, um, and that we are sort of refined or able to distance ourselves from these types of violence. And so it's this reckoning with uh, the narrative, it's by rendering ourselves or trying to render ourselves intelligible, um, that we really uh, flip the Western political, socio-political or ethical political um, structure uh, against itself. And we start to reverberate to a more habituated mode of thinking, a more practiced mode of thinking, which is to say, ah, that can't happen to me. I don't really understand. There's something that's missing um, about the trauma narrative. For the sake of time, I think I'll stop there, uh, but thank you. Okay, and we have roughly eight minutes for questions and I'm gonna be rude and take the first one. <laughs> um, Excellent. So because your paper has uh, sexual violence in the title, I wanna ask you about this. And um, basically I want to question whether or not sexual violence and sexual violence-based trauma um, is analogous to men's or women's experience in war. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like, and just coming from a women's college, in my experience, there's no defensive inattention when the topic of sexual violence comes up and that the desire to explore and explicate and articulate um, the narrative of sexual violence with others is embraced and found to be vital. And, um, and I'm just wondering because sexual violence amongst women is like seven times a day, right? And so running into almost everyone you know who's had some experience with sexual violence is one thing. And so hearing about sexual violence is not as traumatic as like, it's, it's very rare that you run into men or women anymore who have actually gone to combat duty and have experienced the kind of trauma that is referenced. So um, people are more avoidant of that kind of gruesome like experience, but women are perfectly fine usually with, with narratives of sexual violence. And if there is silence around it, it might be because they're a mixed company. So I'm just wondering how, how you're gonna make that work between the two. Yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, like I said, I, I'm a bit stuck in the reeds uh, in just seeing so many um, sort of philosophical tools that I can draw on to make connections that I think I left out a couple of essential ones in this project um, for kind of making sense or, or addressing the concern you bring up. Uh, so a couple of um, thoughts just off the top of my head. I think one thing that is maybe interesting uh, that's a difference between our experiences is that at least where I am, it is much more common to run into, I'm, I'm in the Midwest right now, so it's much more common to run into folks who have experienced combat, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, primarily where I am, um, but it's not unheard of to be uh, hearing about or experiencing the sort of um, conversations and the subsequent sort of shutdown of those conversations uh, that Jonathan Che talks about. In order to really think about how to uh, draw a parallel between those experiences and 
um, the primarily gendered you know, women's experience of sexual violence. Uh, one thing I want to do is distinguish between what's happening sort of at an interpersonal level and what's happening at more a level of um, social narrative or policy. So one thing that I think of, um, I think that like you, Shay, my own experiences of talking about sexual violence in uh, intimate spaces or even in spaces where we'll say the company isn't mixed, right, where it's primarily women, uh, I agree with your, your assessment, right? It's um, considered vital, it's considered important, um, and it's considered essential to be having these types of conversations where I see this um, quieting, where I see this sort of unwillingness to fully talk about, to fully confront narratives of sexual violence is more at a social and policy level. Um, so we don't have these conversations as often in uh, sort of a, a very public space, a public sphere. We are less willing to talk about, you know, the gruesome details of, say, a Brock Turner type sexual assault in policy. We're less willing to confront um, the very drastic and extended uh, both temporal and um, think of like the, the complexity of what a woman deals with after a sexual violence. She may lose her job, she may lose friends, she may lose family members who don't believe her, find her credible. Um, we're less willing to grapple as a society with the extensive potential ramifications for a woman uh, that can be brought about by sexual violence. I think that that parallels nicely with the Jonathan Shea work um, in that the narratives of combat veterans are so often shut down, they're so often quieted um, in a similar fashion in some ways to the narratives that women are trying to articulate about um, sexual violence. Does that kind of, yeah. like I said, I, I missed a few tools that would have been essential <laughs> in kind oh, of making that connection more clear, but thank you for the question. That's fair. All right, we have time for about two more questions. Is that your hand, Melissa? My, that is my hand. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. It's blending into the background. <laughs> it is. It's hard to see against the, <laughs> against the artwork on the wall. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's right there. Make it. So, so my question is, Courtney, I, I, of course, really appreciate the work that you're doing here. And, and the question I have is about whether, about whether it would, whether it's necessary to approach this as a kind of either or question that is whether it's necessary to approach this as a matter of well e either we're doing this kind of um either we're doing this kind of defensive inattention or it's true that um there are some aspects of traumatic experience that may really not be easy to cognize and um it certainly seems to me that there are a, a wealth of examples of people saying that their experience with trauma has been very difficult for them to cognize. So I, I don't want to be too quick to, to jump to the, the idea that, well, they're just mistaken about their own experience. And I especially, you know, since I work with, with children, that especially seems to me important to recognize that that's very likely to be the case when trauma has happened, for instance, to very young children or even pre-verbal children. They don't have anything to cognize that experience. And so having it be unintelligible in some ways, um, that, that, that does actually seem very believable to me. And so, so, so but I just wonder if, if we have to say, well, either it is, you know, always intelligible and cognizable or, you know, something, something's going wrong here and we have to. So I, it just seems to me that maybe we need a, a more of an a both and kind of approach. Sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's like this. If both of those things are happening, then we get a kind of broader picture of, again, the complexities of, of traumatic experience that might be better. Yes, yeah, so I think that's also really helpful. Thank you for uh, saying that. I do not want um, to suggest or imply uh, that we have an either or situation here. Um, what I find troubling is that I think uh, the way that some of the literature talks about um, this issue is that we 
emphasize that there is some element that is unintelligible. I think that makes perfect sense. I think your example of children um, is especially useful to me there, in part because I see myself slipping into one of that those habituated modes of thinking, right? I'm kind of taking up the idea of individuals who experience trauma as being individuals who are of a certain cognitive ability, who have, you know, the ability to communicate in certain ways, who have the um, sort of social and cognitive capacities to make sense of their experiences in certain ways, which both historically hasn't always been possible um, and is certainly not possible across uh, differences in ability or age and so on. Um, so there's there's definitely a, a falling into my own habituated mode of thinking there. Um, the very, you know, Western ethical political stuff I wanted to kind of challenge along with Ami's old students there. Um, but I think that when we think about when we think about the material, um, one of the things that Ami says about defensive inattention, about the question of prevention of genocide, is that it's used as an escape. It's used as a mechanism to move very quickly past the difficulty, past the complexity, um, and to, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought, give me one second. Um, it's used as a way to kind of move past all of this to this uh, genocide-free possible world. And I think that similarly, when we say things, whether it's combat trauma or whether it's sexual violence, where we say, ah, this is unintelligible, it almost functions as a similarly free pass, where we move past the complexity of trying to address exactly what it is that happened. So I think that when we have that language, like Jonathan Shea offers us, uh, that actually Fussell offers us about, you know, we have all of these words that can describe the experiences in war, if we have those, we also have corollaries for victims or survivors of sexual violence. We ought to make more of an effort to use them and to use them in public social policy based spaces um, rather than using it as that free pass, kind of like the students do, to move towards questions of prevention, towards a happier topic. Great. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, we need to get to our second speaker. Everybody give a round of applause. Yay. Right. Next, we have Jessica Vargas Gonzalez, also at BME, and the title of her paper is Fear as a Political and Anti-Political Emotion. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, share the screen. Just... Can you can you see it? Sorry, mm, not nothing yet. There it is. There. Okay. Okay. Well, so thank you. I mean, it's really wonderful for me to be here in your company and uh, having Ami as that person that is that brought us together today, and uh, it's wonderful to to be able to discuss all the many topics that were so dear to me. And uh, to see also many of you engaging directly with uh, with a miss work, so it is a, a sort of beautiful Baronian Orientian conversation today, and I'm really honored to be part of it, and and very very happy to tell the truth. And uh, finally, to organize making this this encounter possible. So what I, um, I would like to uh, I would like to present today is a part of, of my dissertation work, part of the dissertation work, work that I was doing under a missed supervision, and it is entitled "Fear as a Political and Anti-Political Emotion." And uh, I would like to just um, describe briefly what the central motivation of the of the whole project is, what has uh, which has to do with. Uh, sort of assessing um, the normative role of emotions in politics, how we can do that. So my starting point in, in, in the work is basically, I mean, emotions are necessarily present in politics because of the type of things we are. But emotions connect and disconnect us. And so the central question is, how are we to make, to normatively distinguish, to make normative distinctions among the different connections or disconnections that emotions create in political life? That is sort of the central question. I think this is theory relevant because contemporary liberal thought, and here I'm thinking probably of John Rawls as, as the central figure, has approached the emotional dimension of politics in ways that are not satisfactory. But I believe this is also practically important today because we're witnessing 
are the emergence of illiberal forces and a more open confrontation between liberal and, and illiberal values. And so I believe emotions play a central role in this uh, confrontation and that the neglect of their political significance can be dangerous in itself for the liberal democratic project. So this presentation today focuses specifically on fear and it addresses the question of how we are to make normative distinctions regarding how fear intervenes in political life. A brief overview of what I'll be presenting. So a central claim is that a conception of fear as a negative emotion in politics is unsatisfactory. There are threats to democracy that should probably be feared. The problem, as I said, is that a normative framework that classifies emotions as positive or negative is unable to account for the fittingness of fear and the potential constructive role that fear can have in political life. So I argue that a more nuanced normative assessment requires distinguishing between fears that are anti-political or inappropriate and those that are properly political. I propose two criteria to discern the sense in which certain fears may be appropriate in political life. And rather than assuming a consensual conception of politics, I draw on a conflict theory framework in which there is a normative distinction between agonistic conflicts and antagonistic ones. So uh, to begin with, what is fear? So fear is a central mode in which we engage with the world. Uh, it is a central emotion that involves an appraisal of danger. Fear tracks or reveals what we perceive as threats to our well-being. And my approach follows Martin Nussbaum's conception of emotions as cognitive eudaimonistic appraisals. Uh, emotions, cognitive dimension, uh, have to do with how emotions are constantly concerned with receiving and processing information about the world. And their eudaimonistic character resides in their evaluating objects in relation to how we think or imagine that they may affect us or affect our well-being. But fear has been widely regarded as a negative emotion in politics. So Martin Nussbaum's The Monarchy of Fear constitutes a recent defense of the view that fear is fundamentally dangerous in politics. And her central claim there is that fear represents a threat to democracy. Her analysis stresses that fear is politically dangerous because it undermines trust, reciprocity, and cooperation among fellow citizens. Fearful people are highly vulnerable to manipulation and fear easily gives rise to scapegoating. Moreover, Nussbaum argues that uh, fear is politically undesirable because fearful people seek control as a means of reducing uncertainty and vulnerability, and as a result, they either turn to strong rulers or tend to behave monarchically themselves. So fear, Nussbaum says, tends to run ahead of careful thought and lead us into hasty action. They agree with Nussbaum that certain fears are politically dangerous. However, I believe her assessment of fear as merely negative does not capture the complex role this emotion plays in political life. Nussbaum's normative evaluation centers on the undesirable consequences that fear can certainly have in the political realm. But her analysis does not address the fact that fear may sometimes be a fitting response in politics. Unlike Nussbaum, I argue that fear can have a proper political role. That is, certain fears can be appropriate in political life and fear is not simply a threat to democracy. Uh, Martin Nussbaum develops her assessment of emotions in politics in uh, political emotions while love matters for justice. And like John Rawls, Nussbaum endorses a consensual conception of politics, according to which, despite the plurality of comprehensive views present in contemporary liberal societies, it is hoped that citizens reach an overlapping consensus regarding central political values. So she describes a decent society aspiring to justice as an aspiring yet imperfect society that faces problems that arise from citizens being insufficiently motivated to pursue worthy common goals, as well as problems that emerge from dangerous tendencies that lie within us. So Nussbaum argues that there are fundamentally two tasks for the cultivation of emotions in politics. In politics. So one is to engender and sustain strong commitment to worthy projects that require effort and sacrifice. And here the problem is that most people tend toward narrowness of sympathy. And the other related task is to keep at bay forces that lurk in all societies and ultimately in all of us. Tendencies to protect the fragile self by denigrating and subordinating others. 
discussed and envy, the desire to inflict shame upon others. All of these are present in all societies and very likely in every individual human life. Um, okay, so a central theme I'm making is that Nussbaum's assessment of emotions in political life presupposes her consensual conception of politics. On the one hand, emotions are classified as positive if they bring citizens closer together and help sustain their commitments toward the common projects and share political values or ideals. Accordingly, compassion is generally praised as positive because it is a powerful emotion that can move us to act in altruistic ways by bringing us imagin imaginatively close to the suffering of others. On the other hand, emotions that create separations and divisions are classified as negative in politics. These are the emotions that can potentially derail citizens from pursuing valuable common goals. And according to this account, an emotion like fear cannot have any proper political role. It is basically a negative or dangerous emotion. Uh, it follows from this normative account that positive emotions are the ones that should be fostered and cultivated, while negative emotions should be avoided in political life as much as possible. So like Nussbaum, I believe that the same emotion can be engaged in politics in either constructive or dangerous ways. And at the center of my disagreement with Nussbaum is a different understanding of politics and especially of the role of conflict in political life. So instead of presupposing a consensual framework, I contend that an assessment of emotions in politics requires a conflict theory framework that stresses both the cooperative, but also the competitive dimensions of political life. And here is, is, is where I say that um, I believe we should rather take sort of a Arendtian agonistic appro approach, sorry, or framework to normatively assess the role of emotions in politics. Um, so in my view, the main normative difference between two instances of fear lies in the type of conflict that they each give rise to. And I borrow from Hannah Arendt to argue that it depends specifically on whether conflict and political difference are channeled in an agonistic or antagonistic way. So Arendt's view entails that politics is essentially an agonistic realm constituted by people with opposing views regarding the common good who share a commitment to deal in non-violent ways with insurmountable differences. Politics uh, neither depends on nor aims at reaching an overlapping consensus. Politics is inherently conflictual. However, there is a normative opposition between politics and violence. And uh, then to the extent that political opponents show a commitment to playing according to democratic norms, they should be considered to be legitimate adversaries. By contrast, conflict becomes antagonistic when all means are considered valid for winning the political contest and political opponents are regarded as enemies. So I believe Arendt's project is normative in the sense that it's not merely describing how things are. It involves a reflection on how political life should be protected from the dangers of antagonism that constantly threatens it. And my view of fear or my, my analysis of fear in politics builds on this distinction between agonistic and antagonistic conflict. Using the term political in a normative rather than in a descriptive sense, we can say that an emotion is not properly political simply because it has as its nation, political leaders, or praiseworthy goals. Emotions in politics can be anti-political if they foster antagonism. That is, if they contribute to seeing and treating political opponents as enemies that should be confronted by enemies available, including resorting to violence. And anti-political emotions are politically dangerous because they threaten the possibility of finding nonviolent solutions to political disagreements. Uh, so, but unlike Newsman's analysis, which is based on a consensual view of politics, my own view, because it is based on a conflict theory framework, does not entail that all divisions or separations in politics are normatively problematic. So I acknowledge that in-group and out-group dynamics constitute politics in the sense that politics involves an us versus them that is acceptable as long as it takes the form of adversarial contestation. What is unacceptable is when the us versus them dynamic takes an antagonistic form. Those situations involve what I consider to be an anti-political mobiliza mobilization of emotions. And it is right to confront or distance ourselves 
from those who seek to transform the political realm into an antagonistic one, where political opponents are no longer adversaries but enemies. That means an emotion like fear can have a proper political role. Certain divisions and confrontations in the political realm are permissible simply because views are probably unacceptable. And as I said at the beginning, there are threats to democracy that should probably be feared. So I specifically argue that fear of those who threaten central liberal freedoms and who aim to disenfranchise groups of citizens can be appropriate. At the same time, I recognize that some fears are politically dangerous or anti-political. And I propose two criteria for normatively distinguishing between political and anti-political types of fear. Um, the first one is a criterion of fittingness. Properly political fears must be a fitting response to real political threats or dangers. And here I use the criterion of fittingness as discussed by Darns and Jacobson, uh, who say emotions present things to us as having certain evaluative features. And when we ask whether an emotion is fitting, we are asking about the correctness of these presentations. So according to this crit criterion, a fear is unfitting if the evaluative presentation or the appraisal that fear makes is incorrect. That is, something is presented as dangerous or fearsome when it is not. A second criterion would be the criterion of boundedness. Uh, this criterion states that even fitting fears should be kept within proper bounds or limits regarding how they are channeled toward action in the public realm. So this means that the fittingness criterion is not enough or wouldn't be enough to consider an emotion properly political or appropriate in politics. An emotion becomes politically boundless and therefore inappropriate if it is used to justify the view that all means are allowed in the political context. And the boundedness criterion does not refer merely to the intensity of the motion, but to how the motion is channeled toward action. And so this is important because it doesn't mean that very intense emotions would be anti-political and that political emotions would be just moderate or, or tepid emotions. The, the, the criterion is concerned with the consequences of how our emotions are expressed or acted upon in the public realm. So fears become anti-political, even if, it in, if they foster antagonism, if they contribute to seeing others or opponents as enemies that should be confronted by any means available. And this boundedness criterion builds directly on Arendt's conception of politics as agonistic because this conception prevents us from seeing politics as being on a continuum with war that is as unrestricted a struggle. So agonistic democratic politics requires restraints in how emotions that concern our living together are expressed or channeled publicly. Unrestrained or boundless emotions are themselves dangerous. Even emotions that Nussbaum considers to be positive, such as compassion or love, would become dangerous if they were boundless. And this is a warning that Oren already makes in our revolution in her discussion of boundless compassion. So finally, um, I discuss fear as a political emotion and its relevance for confronting the liberal threat. So as I said, an agonistic approach stresses that politics is in inherently conflictual. However, there are views that are unacceptable because they threaten the possibility of dealing in non-violent ways with irreducible political differences. This normative limit implies that certain divisions or confrontations are permissible and even desirable in political life. So I argue in this section that fear in illiberal forces that show dogmatic intolerance and that attempt to set unjustified restrictions on central liberal freedom can be appropriate and even socially desirable. Fear is fitting when political opponents show disregard or openly violate liberal democratic norms. That is, when political opponents show a disposition to change the rules of the democratic game and play politics as a non-restrained competitive, competitive game, for instance, by disenfranchising voters, dismantling the system of checks and balances, not recognizing electoral results, fostering violent riots, etc. In those situations, we legitimately and fittingly fear the implications of political opponents shaming pub, uh, shaping public policies on important issues of common interest. I believe in those situations, we rightly fear the opponent's success in shaping the immediate or foreseeable future of the polity. The problem is that a consensual approach like Nussbaum's cannot offer guidance when we encounter the sort of threats and extreme conflict that emerges 
from confronting illiberal or anti-political views. So to this sort of challenge, Newsman's assessment of emotions in a decent society aspiring to justice offers no response. It is certainly insufficient to speak of cultivating emotions that bring us together, such as love or compassion. Moreover, by regarding fear as fundamentally negative in politics, Newsman's approach cannot identify how fear could be adequately engaged in the defense of the liberal, of the liberal democratic project. So it is my view that fearlessness, when fear is called for, is politically dangerous because it means that citizens are not tracking the dangers and threats to an agonistic life. I believe fear in those situations or its absence can denote citizens' care or indifference towards politics. But uh, fear is politically desire, desirable not only to signal the threat. Certain forms of fear are socially desirable because of their potential connection to political action. An emotion like fear can move citizens to think or imagine possible responses to collective action problems. And in the current political context, I believe fear is required not to normalize the present. A failure to respond emotionally to the threat illiberal forces pose may lead to illiberalism winning the political contest. So my claim that some fears are fitting and called for in politics entails a bidirectional relation between emotions and imagination. Not only do images arouse emotions, as in the case in which we portray uh, certain people or groups as a threat to us, emotions can also mobilize the imagination in terms of imagining or devising ways in which we may intervene politically in order to counteract the current threats. But because political action is collective, this entails that we need ways to imagine together that things might as well be different from what they actually are. And here I'm thinking of Arendt's conception of the imagination as a condition of possibility for action. So I believe fear can be a crucial part of an adequate emotional attunement to the non-ideal political world we live in. Without fear, or to borrow Arendt's words from uh, the end of, of the origins, Without a fearful imagination, sensitive to the threats that we face, our capacity to imagine forms of intervention in the present out of a concern for the future would be severely hindered. So I've argued so far that fear is not merely a negative emotion in politics. Fear can be fitting. However, even fitting fears that identify real political threats need to be adequately channeled to be political. This is the second criterion of boundedness. The criterion of boundedness implies that normative restraints are required regarding how the illiberal threat is confronted in the current political context. Although illiberal forces are not mere adversaries in the sense that they are real threats, they should not be treated as enemies either if we aim to reconstruct an agonistic political space. So I believe fear, even if fitting, should not be compoundless. In the current open confrontation between liberal and illiberal views, I believe the most difficult challenge lies in mobilizing electoral majorities while respecting agonistic normative restraints. In other words, the, the challenge lies in devising ways to respond and win within an agonistic democratic framework to those who want to antagonize, that is, to those who want to play politics affirmatively on restrained game. Fear of illiberalism confronts the question of how the defense or reconstruction of an agonistic political space should be pursued. And like I rant, I believe this is a task that requires the conjoined human faculties of passion, imagination, and action. But there is a final challenge that I would like to, to mention. Je Jessica, to I, I'm yes? sorry. I, I'm not sure if you've been getting my messages or not. You no. have about time for one question. So you can... You can either finish or you can give Maria a chance to ask her question. I'm sorry, I've been sending you like time messages in the chat. I, I just realized you might not be able to see them. Sorry, no. Can I just, I mean, it's going to be very brief. It's just okay. one, one more idea. Just letting you know. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, so the, the, just, just to finish, just the, the final idea would be that there is a major challenge that has to do with fear social dimension, which is how even normatively justified fears those that are fitting in terms of their object are also susceptible to becoming anti-political in the sense of boundless 
due to the cognitive, social, and reputational mechanisms that tend to move people to extreme positions. And here I'm thinking of the natural pluralization that occurs as we engage in discussion only with like-minded pe like people, for example, or the reputational demands to hold pure positions. So empirical evidence enables us to understand that people who are moved by justified fears are not necessarily more principled. Their positions are also largely socially shaped, and that refers to some, some dangers to political life that are inherent to the type of things we are. So uh, thinking of fear in, a, in politically polarized moments, I think there is a sense in which political polarization is dangerously fearless. And, that, and political polarization, as I understand it, involves a change in the social norms or expectations that govern what is considered acceptable in the public space. And specifically, it, it implies a certain, a greater acceptance of antagonistic behavior. And I think that the, the danger is that we're not fully aware of the dangers involved in antagonism becoming increasingly normal or acceptable. So my concern here is that as antagonistic behavior and therefore anti-political fears and emotions become increasingly normal, there is, a, there is less of a space of reconstructed and agonistic political space. Uh, even those who want to oppose illiberal forces within this polarized logic may want to respond like them. And so in the end, we may see anti-political behavior and emotions on both sides of the political divide. And the greatest danger, as I see it, is that political opponents who have come to see and treat each other as enemies may not be so different in the end. So and with this, this is the final idea. My effort in introducing these criteria to distinguish normatively between types of fear in politics is an attempt basically to reject these two extremes. On the one hand, an unsatisfactory account of fear as essentially negative in politics, but on the other hand, also the normalization of fears, such as the ones that we're increasing, increasingly observing in politically polarized societies that contribute to creating uh, and sustaining politics as antagonistic. So thank you very much. And uh, All right, thank you, Jessica. I'm, um, I'm really sorry, I never saw your messages. <laughs> no, that's okay, I'm, I'm, that's, that's my bad. I didn't realize. Um, so we are, basically out of time for Jessica, but I know that uh, Maria has been waiting very wonderfully for her question. Um, I do wanna save any other questions for the in-between time like we've been doing so that Eric has uh, plenty of time to, to do his presentation. Okay, Maria. Maria, are you still with us? You're muted. Um, here. There you go, okay. Okay, sorry. Thank you so much. I, it, it means a lot to me to participate here. You know, I'm in Mexico where Jessica is, but I knew and was uh, very close to Ami, and she was perhaps one of the few friends I met uh, at the beginning of my first uh, uh, English book, uh, the book I uh, wrote in English. Well, now I'll go to, to Jessica's uh, paper, which I thought was a wonderful paper, and I just thought that she's missing a third person here on the critical inside. It's not only um, uh, Martha Nussbaum, but Chantal Mouffe. And I think that the problem is, is to, it is precisely because the idea that you can become um, ad, uh, adversaries and, and restraint, another um, feeling, another emotion, which is hatred. I, I see fear as involving also the possibility as adversaries and hatred. But there is a, another possibility of seeing fear as Jessica well taught us, which is that fear also has a cognitive dimension as signals that can tell us that something bad can happen. But then there is a much more needed effort here to, to speak not only about the public fear and manipulation of, of uh, images, as, as she said, but also of how to construct the social imaginary of, let's say, projects that are normatively acceptable instead of providing um, this very antagonistic way that we have seen lately in, um, in the United States with Trump, but also here in Mexico with our uh, president. That's my question. <laughs> 
Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Yeah. No. Thank you, Maria. Um, so my 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 project is is is, is engaged. Is 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 so. Uh, yeah, I do care about the relationship between images and emotions and how they relate. Um, so I think uh, um, the first criterion, the, the one of uh, fittingness, uh, would be useful to think of images that are unfitting in terms of of uh, um, of hatred. Yeah, exactly. Of, Giving of us fear. to fears or hatred that are really not substantiated. That that. Um, that wouldn't be uh, that that wouldn't that wouldn't involve uh, the right up, uh, right appraisals. So I think um, that first, um, I mean, at, at that moment is when we could say um, there are images here that are problematic and that are raising emotions. Then that uh, that have the potential to become anti-political in this sense of being unfitting first, and in the additional sense that would be um, that can I mean potentially even more dangerous probably that has to do with the boundlessness um yeah but here i, th I think uh, i mean I, I i although i am interested in in the issue of how emotions and, and, and imaginations in and, and imagination interact i'm really not engaging with how social imaginaries are are constructed are constructed and i think that's uh, probably something that that you are uh, addressing already more on your own work. Um, but I did want to, uh, to point out to a sort of relationship between emotions and imagination uh, that I think Arendt calls our attention towards that. So how uh, being emotionally moved can also move us, moves our, our imagination, how that is important for action. That was, that is sort of a specific dimension in which I think um, uh, that Arendt, Arendt's conception of the imagination is also very, very useful. But that's <laughs> that's all I would say at the moment. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, I'm sure, again, we can uh, have some more questions for her afterwards. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Very good paper. All right. Our third speaker is Eric. Eric, what's your last name? Eric Janek, is that correct? Yeah. Janek, Janek is good. Eric Janek, sorry also at Bingy, and the title of his paper is The Impossibility of Political Fascism. All right, um, so I'd just like to first add my thanks to the organizers for thinking of us and having us here. Um, I also like to just logistically apologize. My computer is weird and the camera is in the bottom of the screen instead of the top, so it's gonna look like I'm not looking at you. So I apologize I, when you're asking questions and throughout this. And so what I'm presenting here is kind of the heart of a chapter of my dissertation that I was actively working on with Ami most recently. And it is about, as was mentioned, fascism. And so the rough argument that I'm going to be making is that we can analyze forms of social organization, figure out which ones are essentially fascist. And once we've, we've done that, we can then accurately claim that they're not just bad, they're not just like unpleasant or awful, they're just not political. And so we can just not allow them into politics. And so as I mentioned, this is part of the, of the dissertation. And so this is coming from an attempt to construct a form of political realism that kind of wiggles in between real politic on one side and uh, kind of like attempts at liberal forms of realism on the other. And in addition, what I'm talking about here is going to be kind of explicitly kind of like actual political organizations and structures, the kind of like whether speech in the public domain and that sort of thing, I'm putting to the side for now. I think there's probably things to be done there, but I think that's much harder than I can do right now. Okay, so yes, as I mentioned, I don't think that fascism is bad politics. I don't think it's unjust, although it is both of those things, but that's not the important claim. The claim is that it's just different from other forms of politics in a way that just illegitimizes it. And so like an orange is not a better or a worse apple than a Fuji or a Honeycrisp. It's just not an apple. And so we, we can't compare them. They're incommensurate in an important way. 
And so, um, as anyone who's done some reading on this knows, fascism is kind of a famously murky and moving target, trying to find kind of like a central thread that runs through all of the many varied ways that it's expressed itself. And so I have picked one that I think works along with most of them. There are other popular ones, such as the capitalist corporatist versions that gets a lot of play. But I think that most of the ones that I'm not mentioning are giving causal or kind of uh, descriptive under, um, descriptions of fascism. And what I'm looking at is the justificatory conceptualizations here. And so the important ones are twofold. And the big one is that there's a social hierarchy. It's based on usually race, gender, culture. They're usually viciously gendered. And that hierarchy is based on natural social kinds. And the second one is that there is a sort of irrationality or irrationality about that hier hierarchy and the categories, and that the methods for defense of them will then will follow that rule. And so that's, again, not point of the critique. The problem with fascism isn't that it's irrational or irrational, it's that it's not political. So the, but the irrationality part plays into my explanation of why it's not political. And so you can see modern fascism attempting to blend itself into kind of modern knowledge production venues. So kind of academic knowledge production. Uh, so kind of like biorealism, things like that. You get these sorts of sciences of essentialism. And so this is a kind of way to attempt to infiltrate the rational modes of explanation to justify itself. And so those usually, and in fact, never don't work. Okay, thank you. Um, and so if that were possible, it would be a problem for this, but it's just not possible. It's just, I don't think that there's a good explanation for natural social kinds of the sort that they would need to make this work. All right, and so what I'm going to do now is look at legitimacy, which is what I'm focusing on here. So I'm not looking at justice again, but legitimacy. So this also is strained to sorts of modern states. And I'm going to use Bernard Williams as my kind of exemplar of liberal realism. And I think all of the more moral realism or more moral liberalisms will have, will fall victim to the same sort of critiques. All right. And so what Williams does is he takes Hobbes' legitimacy structure, and that is the what he calls the basic legitimation demand. And that is just that the state provides safety and security for everybody equally. And that's it. That's kind of all that's required there. And to that, he says that in modernity, there are certain contingent factors about whatever society you happen to be living in. And those ought to be added on to the legitimation demand. And so in modernity, if you look around, you notice that liberalism is the hegemonic way of like states constructing themselves. And so he's going to say that to be legitimate in modernity, you have to both satisfy the BLD and do that in a liberal way. And so the problem with this is that the liberalism part is both vulnerable to fascism and that it doesn't do, um, that you can get the legitimation demand fulfilled without it. And so because it's based on the contingent facts of the world, if fascism, if there were a fascist international, you know, they took over many, many states, they won, that would no longer work. What modernity would then consist of is the BLD plus fascism. And that would obviously be bad. And so I think we need to retreat and cut that off. But I agree that there's certain points about contingency that are important, but the liberalism, sorry, the liberalism itself does not actually generate any of the legitimating power. And so what actually does it is just Hobbes. And you can do that on its own. And that by itself can eliminate fascism as a viable political option. And so the important points of the contract portion of Hobbes that he offers are that it's universal and identical. So it has to be offered to everybody and the offering has to be the same to everybody. And so the immediate problem there is that fascism has a hierarchy as a basic presumption. It's not vulnerable to disproof because their modes of explanation are irrational. There's this kind of like hearkening back to a mythic past is a common one from Griffin, the palingenetic explanation 
or just any kind of like these hierarchies are based in kind of like immutable social kinds for fascists. And so that hierarchy is then going to instantly generate a, a disparity in either to whom this, uh, this contract is offered when you're legitimizing the state or to what is offered the various members of that state. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, and so the claim there is that just because of that, just from Hobbes all on its own, you can then immediately claim that any attempt at fascism is going to just be necessarily non-political. And then you can do lots of what seems to me useful things in attempting to combat it. Sorry, I'm getting some, apparently my mic is wonky, I apologize. So hopefully, um, please let me know if it continues to be bad. I'm in a hotel with, uh, I don't know how good the internet is here, so apologies. Um, okay, so looking at some quick uh, attempts that a fascism could attempt to say, wiggle out of this problem, they could claim that identical requirements aren't necessary and that's a method of disenfranchisement and that it's, it's acceptable to disen disenfranchise people and remain legitimate. They could claim that the universality could be constrained and so it's universal among the in-group and that's good enough. And that's a sort of means of like eliminating everybody who isn't them from the consideration of the state, or they could attempt to redefine the basic conditions of politics. So going backwards, um, redefining the basic conditions of politics is going to be really hard because Hobbes's requirements are so basic and minimal and stark. Like anything less than that seems like you're, you're not doing it. You're in the state of war that he mentions. You're just out there fighting and beating up and being stronger than other people. Other people are stronger than you. There's kind of like nothing else available. You can't go lower than this. So I don't think that, that one will work for them. And I don't think disenfranchisement. So this is again, claiming that you can offer different requirements. You can just give some people greater burdens. You can restrict their rights to a greater degree. Uh, that also is not going to work because the whole point of this is to secure the ability to cooperate, to solve collective action problems in a group with people. And so as soon as you insert those inequalities, you've, you've failed that test. You're instantly removing the motivation to join the, the state in the first place. And so the other point about offering it to a limited group of people, I think the way to get away from that is to point out the ahistoricity of that claim. The idea that there was ever a kind of homogenous territory ruled over in a state-like manner by the in-group that the fascists are attempting to claim should be in charge of everything is just not seeming to be the case. And in addition, if they had kind of like a sub-state version of this, kind of like a tribal version, then, then you, you would have to be kind of like seizing additional, additional territory. You'd have to be like taking over from people. You would just be at war with people. And so attempting to do it that way is also legitimate. You're just accepting that you are at war with people. And honestly, I think that this is the case. This is the point I'm trying to make is that all forms of political arrangement are in a necessary state of war with fascism as a form of political arrangement. It is not political. It can never be political. There's no way to move it around so that any way that a fascist using the apparatus of a state can ever be justified on political grounds. And so I recognize that fascists won't care about this. This is not aimed at trying to like convince fascists not to be fascist. This is aimed at everybody else and kind of an attempt to claim that we don't need to do something million. We don't need to have like have a marketplace of ideas. We don't need to accept even the possibility of them. And so something like Rawls like claimed that they're unreasonable people. Like it's, it's prior to that. They're eliminated before they even get there as like a potential person who can like wield power in a state. And so, yes, that's about where I am at this. Great, okay. Um, thank you, Eric, for also being very timely. And we have plenty of time for questions for Eric and also um, maybe towards the end if people wanna squeeze in another one uh, 
for Jessica if there's time. So yeah, I'm first happy we have ask questions, ask questions of the other presenters as well. Uh, yes, uh, Naomi. Uh, thank you. I, I like this approach a lot. Um, but I'm wondering what you would say to someone who, under the influence of Charles Mills as a racial contract, um, would argue that you've not just eliminated fascism, you've also eliminated the United States. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I've gotten this kind of like specific question as well. And one way to go about it is to point out the kind of modernity of fascism as a specific type of political arrangement. So I've kind of focused on the essential characteristic, but there's more kind of like building up around it in every form that it's been applied. And my second option is that I'm not sure that I mind if we kind of like say that kind of like pre-Civil War, at least the United States was, was doing like racial hierarchy in a sort of like naturalized social kind way in a way that's just going to be illegitimate. They were, I guess it was, it was a tyrannical mode of government. And as that projects into the modern world, as, as Mills does, he's not concerned with that, of course, um, it gets trickier, like, but yeah, I do think like the naturalized social kinds as the justification for the wielding of political power is going to be the defining factor. So I'm happy to say that kind of large swaths of the existing Republican party could be successfully and accurately considered fascist. I'm not sure if that, if that answers your question or if you want one. Um, it, it certainly addresses it. Um, I'm just thinking if one takes the scope of, of that book and that approach really seriously, the ways in which um, white supremacy is sort of woven into what one thinks of as, you know, the U.S. democracy. Um, that, I mean, I mean, I need to think about this because it might be, I mean, as you say, you know, yeah, but but then it's the domain on which we enact the political these days. So so I'm just anyway. Sorry, this is rambling, and and you're certainly addressing the issue. Um, so Eric, I have a question, and it's straightforwardly a clarification question that I probably missed. I was juggling very many things. Um, so I heard you say a very important claim that fascism can never be justified on political grounds. Um, and this may be my misunderstanding of political systems, but I assume or have always assumed possibly very wrongly that we call fascism fascism because we know that it's not justified or legitimate. Um, and so then it makes me, it, it makes me wonder what else is going on in this um, relationality between what you're saying about fascism and all of the other political systems, right? Being at war with one another. Because I, I guess the, the way I understand fascism is that, yes, that's true. So am I missing, this is just a, like a, I'm sorry, I was not 100% here. Um, is there something about fascism inherently that makes it the case that it is sometimes or presumed to be um, an, a legitimate political system? I mean, so in reality, it has of course seized political power, um, but I think that the way lots of modern, again, it's the hegemony, lots of political liberalism has trouble kind of eliminating it in this way. You kind of have to take it at face value. So again, you have to like take the claims that people are making they're hiding them in our kind of our Finding recommendation for designation of the Fairfax Theater. Thanks. Um, right. So they're hiding these attempts. They're not being. They're not arguing in good faith. And most uh, liberal attempts are going to have to try and engage with that and like disprove them in rational means. They're looking for the overlapping consensus. And what I'm saying is, you don't even have to do that. There's no paradox of toleration. It's not a paradox. It's just like they're just like distinct in a very very fundamental way. And so, again, this is part of the dissertation. I'm working on a lot of like incommensurability. It's just, they're just like fundamentally separate in kind. And I'm not sure if that, if that helps because I feel like I've kind of just restated yeah. what you said, but. Well, no, the, the incommensurability point is quite helpful. So that, that answers all of it, yeah. 
Other questions? Anybody hand blending in with their background? Any questions that the presenters want to exchange with one another? Or any last burning questions for Jessica's paper or Courtney's paper? No? Okay, well then I think it doesn't kill us to finish a little bit early and get a little bit of a longer uh, Facebook break. <laughs> um, and we will see you at 4.30, 4.30 Central Time. Um, 4.30, <laughs> 3.30, 3.30 Central Time. 3.30 Central Time, but please do try to log in five minutes early uh, so that you're all set up. But if you're a presenter, uh, please log in at least 10 minutes early just so that we can make sure everything's working. I am going to end the meeting, like I said in my last email, to process the recording. So we'll see everybody at 3.25 and the presenters at 3.20 p.m. Central Time.